Welcome to EWTN News Nightly. I'm Colleen Carroll Campbell. Tonight's top stories. As Americans gear up for their once a year Thanksgiving feast, some are bucking our fast food culture by making made from scratch family meals a daily habit. We'll tell you about the slow food movement that's attracting Catholics. House Speaker John Boehner says immigration reform is still alive, but Congress is divided on the issue and time is running out. We'll talk with Archbishop Jose Gomez, who's leading the bishop's push for reform. And 50 years after Vatican II, how has the council changed the church? And how can lay Catholics integrate its message into our lives? We'll take a closer look at the ongoing debate. for joining us. On this eve of Thanksgiving, Americans are busy preparing family feasts with turkey and all the trimmings. But those made from scratch family meals are increasingly rare in our fast food society. A new survey from Harris Interactive and the nonprofit Renfrew Center Foundation found that 64% of American families don't eat dinner together every night, most often due to busy schedules. But there is a counter trend afoot, a movement toward more leisurely intentional eating that's catching on with people of faith. EWTN News Nightly's Jason Calvey reports. Tucked in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley, the homestead of Christendom College professor John Cutterback and family. The natural, made from scratch meals. In 20 minutes, that should be done. With local, organically grown produce. Usually at like 10 or 12. Okay. Give us a taste, not of fast food, but slow food. The secular movement towards slow food sprouted in Italy in the late 1980s, a protest against the first McDonald's built in Rome. Now the movement's growing worldwide and resonating with some Catholics. The production of slow food kind of creates a quiet inside that seems to be conducive to contemplation and a richer life with God. It's also kinder to the environment. So you're not going to find any chemical fertilizers on this farm, but what you will find is this compost pile. Things like grass clippings and, and twigs all coming together to form this nutrient-rich fertilizer that can be used on the family's garden. I think of God's love for me, honestly, when I think, you've designed this, Lord. You've designed this so that if I take the green, I take the brown, I put them together, you've designed it so that something wonderful happens. I feel like I'm, I'm taking part in the way God meant it to be. On the Cutterback farm, that sense of the divine order is even reflected in the raising of pigs. Scraps aren't thrown away, but served. Eggshells, rotten cheese. The pigs are also fattened on self-serve acorns, Especially thus the title of Cutterback's blog, Bacon from Acorns. The price of corn keeps going up. And in general, we have to use fossil fuels to produce corn. Most pigs in the industrial model are fattened on corn. So compare that with these acorns that, again, by the energy of the sun, are being produced in great abundance. Sure. It's not just rural Catholics savoring slow food. These tomatoes come from local D.C. farmers markets. Kim Smolik is board member of Slow Food D.C. and the executive director of the Franciscan Mission Service. I know the farmers that I'm buying from on a weekly basis, so that creates a connection to my local community. These are all our Christian and Catholic values. Community, uh, ritual, uh, slowing down, caring for ourselves, caring for others. Critics say the higher costs of organic slow foods are not realistic for people of lower incomes. Smolik says it's all about choices. You go out to eat and you spend 40 bucks on a meal. Well, if you transfer that to your grocery bill, you can afford organic. But what about the time it takes to make meals from scratch? Cutterback's 16-year-old daughter, Paulina, says. It was a lot of work, but it's really worth it. We have a really special bond because of it. Thanking, resting, connecting, one bite at a time. Joining me now to talk about the slow food movement and the larger issue of Christian environmentalism are Dr. Mark T. Mitchell, chairman of the Department of Government at Patrick Henry College and editor of Front Porch Republic, an online magazine, and James Ennis, executive director of Catholic Rural Life, a group that's been serving the rural church since 1923. Welcome to you both. 
Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, Jim, I'll start with you. You recently met Pope Francis, and interestingly enough, the founder of Slow Food International reported that the Pope uh, picked up the phone and gave him a call not long ago, I believe it was in October, right. uh, encouraging him in his work. So this is obviously an issue uh, the Pope cares about. Why should ordinary Catholics care? Well, it's interesting, all three popes, Blessed John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, and Pope Francis care about food, care about agriculture, and also uh, call us to be good stewards of the environment. So they see agriculture and food being connected, and they see it very important that, that Catholics be involved in supporting a personal community ag type of agriculture. And why is that important? How does it connect with our faith? Well, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops wrote a letter 10 years ago, and that food is a basic element for everyone. Everyone needs to eat. We don't have any farms, no food. And so food sustains life. It's not just any type of, it's just not a commodity. It's, it's something that needs to be cherished, and agriculture lands need to be cared for, so that for future generations, we can continue to grow food and provide food for everyone. And Mark, this is a movement in general that's been associated with the secular left, at least in the minds of many Christians, and, and um, I know many Catholics feel that way, the sense that uh, if I'm pro-life, I can't necessarily be pro-environment because that's kind of where all the folks are who are, you know, always bemoaning, uh, you know, overpopulation, and they're more focused on trees than babies. Yeah. Why is there that dichotomy, and does it have to be there? Well, it certainly doesn't have to be there, and it's unfortunate. The, um, the fact of the matter is, um, in for when Christians um, reject that uh, care for the environment as a response to the fact that it seems to be owned by the left, they're, they're, they're uh, reacting rather than, than thinking intelligently about the, the issues and the, and the, and the theological um, import of those issues. It's a kind of uh, rejection by reaction rather than a thoughtful um, position. So uh, this is a natural for, uh, for, for Christians. It seems that People who take a, a, a strong view of, of the created order should be the best stewards, should be uh, at the forefront of, of, uh, of, of stewardship movements, concern for the uh, creation. Uh, this, this should be owned by, by Christians. It's, it's, this is a natural, and it's unfortunate that in the last uh, decades, um, too many Christians have seen this as, a, as, as something to oppose rather to, than to embrace. Mm -hmm. And a big part of this slow food movement uh, in, is, is local, an emphasis on localism. And this is something in the Front Porch Republic that you and, and the other writers there emphasize a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about place, limits, liberty, mm -hmm. and support for localism in, in all of its forms. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that word localism? Why is it so important I know where my meat comes from or I know the, you know, the mm -hmm. person who's selling me my, my veggies? Yeah, well, um, I, I don't know if you always have to know the person, but uh, if we think of the flip side, that is uh, industrial food has, has reduced food to a kind of uh, a mechanized process that, uh, that, that has, has, has treated the natural world as, as simply a machine and therefore, as, as uh, writer Wendell Berry says, that has, we've come to think of our bodies merely as machines, machines to be nourished with calories rather than uh, to, be, to be treated well, to be fed. With, uh, with, with food that, that is, uh, has been cared for well, has been cared for by those who are treating the natural world as it ought to be treated. And, and therefore, we, we've, we've come to think of our bodies merely in uh, mechanized terms. Uh, and, and obviously, as, as Christians, this is, this is uh, theologically all, all, all wrong. We need to Where think does that about, lead theologically, if you do think of your body just as a machine that needs its input to, yeah, to do yeah. its work? Well, it, think of if, if we, 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 it neglects the, uh, the theology of embodiment and even calls into question or, or a suspicion the idea of the incarnation, mm -hmm. uh, that bodies are uh, part of the created order. We are embodied souls. That's what it, mean, it means to be a human being. And if we, if we neglect the import of bodies, uh, we, the, so many of our pathologies today are rooted in this, from, from uh, eating poorly that leads to obesity, to, to abortion, to, to all of the things that, that are, are many of the things that are, are huge concerns, are rooted in an inattention to the theology of the body. Mm -hmm. And food is a great 
sort of wedge issue to get into this and, and, to, and, and to, to clarify some of these important concerns. Now, Jim, you spent about two decades away from the church, and you came back in large That's part right. through reading the theology of the body. Okay. You've said that now what the church needs is a theology of the environment or of agriculture. What do you mean by that, and what would that look like? Well, first of all, we've, we've lost a theology of the creation, and therefore, as Mark was mentioning, we're treating creation, nature, like, like it's just a commodity, just as economic units that uh, you can dispose of easily. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it as a theology of creation, that God has created all things good, that we as human beings are steward, to be stewards of that environment. So it changes everything in terms of how we look at animals, how we treat the land, how do we protect soil and water resources. So it, it has a, a total impact on how I live my life, if it, whether I'm in a rural community or I'm in an urban community. I think about nature as something from God, the creator. But our culture is now calling, looking at nature and, not, and taking the creator out of the picture. And when you take the creator out of the picture, then we are just machines. And real quickly, what would you say to a family with, you know, they live in the city, two working parents, you know, having a from scratch meal every night, not an option, starting their own farm in the backyard, also not an option. What are some baby steps a viewer could take who says, I want to move a little more into this mindset without making any radical, drastic changes? Well, I have, four, I have five children, and so my wife and I, too, have just taken baby steps. And we start trying to support local farms through our local farmer's market. When we can, we try to uh, buy locally. So we look at our local grocery store and ask them, are these apples from the local orchards? Where does this food come from? You ask your grocer where those food come from. Are you supporting the local farms in your community? So you begin to research. And like in Minnesota, where I live, they have a directory on all the different farms. And some of these farms actually allow people to come visit. And there also is a move movement around the community-supported agriculture, where communities are supporting local farms by buying shares into those farms. And then they get fruits and vegetables on a weekly basis for a certain period of time. Mm. So families can start just incrementally, taking incremental steps to support local agriculture. But consumers can send a very powerful message to their grocery stores that I'm concerned about sourcing locally when possible. Because you think of the average food product travels 1,500 miles that uh, to the grocery store here in the United States. And that was a study out of the Iowa State University. They, we, as consumers, can ask our grocery stores to f uh, source local when possible. And in many communities, it is possible to find local farmers to provide fruits and vegetables and dairy products. And you see that as a Catholic value, and a Christian value? I do, because I think it's expressing our uh, faith by putting our faith in action. Jesus said to be salt and light in our communities. And if we don't put our faith in action, our faith becomes irrelevant. And we really do need to exercise faith in these areas that are that, um, around foods because it's, it's a way of being a good steward of our environment by supporting local farms. Also, uh, continuing to send the message that we care about how these foods are produced, how farm workers are treated, and, and to continue to communicate these values, these Christian values to um, our community. James Ennis, Mark Mitchell, thank you both for joining me. Thank you, Colleen. We have to run to a break right now, but when we come back, we'll talk with Archbishop Jose Gomez about what he calls the human rights test of our generation. Stay with us. back to EWTN News Nightly. I'm Colleen Carroll Campbell. House Speaker John Boehner said last week that immigration reform is absolutely not dead. But with only eight working days left in its calendar, the House looks unlikely to take up the issue this year. And that means that the status of America's 11 million undocumented immigrants remains in limbo. Few groups have advocated more forcefully for those immigrants than the U.S. Catholic bishops. I recently had a chance to sit down with the bishop's point person on immigration, Los Angeles Archbishop Jose Gomez. Gomez, a U.S. citizen who was born in Mexico, is the author of a new book, Immigration and the Next America.
You've written in your book that, that uh, this is both a life issue and a family issue, immigration right. now. And you've said that it's the human rights test of our generation. But you've also distinguished immigration um, from something like abortion, where the church has a you know, very clear non-negotiable stance and, and there's not much room for prudential judgment. So how do you kind of put those two things together? Because I think for a lot of Catholics, it gets a little confusing. We're supposed to listen to the bishops on this, and yet it's not one of those issues that's just completely black or white there's one solution and I can't even you know sort of conceive of right. another as a faithful Catholic yeah well I mean uh, it is true that there are many different options of how to handle the immigration situation in our country uh, and um, uh, but I think it's important to not to lose the the understanding that we are talking about people mm. Uh, fathers and mothers and children and brothers and sisters there uh, and I think the gospel calls us to especially uh, uh, love one another mm -hmm. and I think it was beautiful to see how the Holy Father went to uh, Lampedusa in mm -hmm. southern Italy and he talked about that that we cannot forget that these people that are immigrants are, uh, are, are brothers and sisters so I think it is important to, to remember that as we think of what is the best way to address the, the reality of uh, the movements of people in the world? And what are some of the aspects of the human side of this that you think maybe some of our viewers don't know that maybe you see as a pastor on the ground where you are? Well, I think the first, the first uh, element is that a lot of the immigrants that are coming to the United States are Catholics. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that go to church on Sunday. And, and they are they're volunteers in our churches. They want to practice their faith. They have beautiful families. And they want to make a, a great contribution to our country. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we just see them uh, from the um, uh, negative side, thinking these people uh, came here uh, breaking the law and, uh, and they need to be punished. Well, they had to break the law because there is no other way to come to this country. You are coming to, uh, to uh, do menial work. Mm. So I think it's important to understand that these men and women that are here with their families are just like us going to church on Sunday. There have been uh, signs that the longer uh, immigrants are here, uh, often Latino immigrants begin to drift away from regular practice of the faith or uh, you know, into other Christian traditions, uh, often becoming more socially liberal as well. And so to what do you attribute that? It's a combination of things. Obviously, there is a, a tendency historically uh, in that way because all immigrants coming for the first time to the United States had that tendency. You think of the Irish or the Italians or the Germans. Mm -hmm. They all went through that. Uh, and there is big danger of secularization in our country mm -hmm. you know, because we, we live com comfortable lives here in our country and then the tendency is to forget about God. But at the same time, in my experience, this, especially the Latinos that are coming to our country, uh, a lot of them coming from Mexico and from the central part of Mexico where the evangelization was r really deep, the first evangelization, they, 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 they keep their faith no matter what. Mm. And their values that they have are just faith, family, uh, uh, community, the same values that we are expecting from any Catholic in the United States. Mm. So I, there is a little tendency to that, but I, I think uh, the reality is that uh, I have a lot of hope that they are going to stay uh, faithful Catholics. All right. Well, thank you so much, Your Excellency, for joining sure. us. Sure. Thank you. The Year of Faith, which came to a close on Sunday, marked the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. That council affected everything in the life of the Church from the liturgy to the role of the laity. EWTN News Nightly's Jonathan Liedel recently talked with two Catholics who experienced the council up close and personal half a century ago. <laughs> Vatican II. For those who were there, it was a memorable time, not just for its style, but also for its substance. Michael Novak was in Rome working as a journalist in 1963. It was the epicenter of my life, put it that way. It's the year we were married, Karen and I. He and his wife used gifts from their wedding to pay the way and joined over 2,000 bishops in Rome. Among them, future Pope Carol Wojtyla. But I said, you know, council happens only once in a century. We have to go. We just have to go. 
The newlyweds made memories in the eternal city that would last a lifetime. She and I were crossing St. Peter's Square in the light of the moon and the fountains were spraying silver. That was both a very exciting year for us in our lives, but it was just so unbelievably exciting at the council. Even so, Novak was concerned about how the council might be misinterpreted. I expected uh, that there would be some very large downturns. The craziness that overtook the liturgy, the tremendous number of priests and nuns who left their vocation, the real meat and potatoes of Catholic, the Catholic intellectual tradition was abandoned. Father John O'Malley was also in Rome for parts of Vatican II, working on his dissertation. I was very lucky to get tickets to the opening session of the second period. This basilica was filled with people. O'Malley looks at the consequences of Vatican II differently than Novak does. People say that the council opened the door to a lot of problems in the church. What we fail to realize is there have always been a lot of problems in the church. It changed our lives in so many ways and by and large, positively. Novak's review is a little more mixed, but now, 50 years later, I don't feel quite so pessimistic about the church, battered as it is, hurt by our own scandals as we are. There's such vitality in the young clergy. Vocations are on an uptick again. There's a rebound coming. Joining me now to talk about the implications of Vatican II is theologian David Schindler. Dr. Schindler is Dean Emeritus of the D.C.-based John Paul II Institute. He's also the editor-in-chief of the North American edition of Communio, a theological journal co-founded by Joseph Ratzinger, whom the world would later know as Pope Benedict XVI. Welcome, Dr. Schindler. Thank you. Nice to be here. David, let's start with this phrase that is, is probably the most memorable one for Catholics when they think of Vatican II, and that is the universal call to holiness. Now, you said that that's a radical proposal, but haven't Christians always been called to holiness? What, what's so radical about that? Yes, no, I think in a certain sense you could say the council, the heart of the council was uh, the, the universal call to holiness and a revitalization of understanding of the church, liturgy, and so forth, all of those in service of that. And I think the key is really uh, what Benedict, Pope Benedict used to say in different ways, that the heart of the question is, is the recovery of the reality of God and the difference that makes in all areas of our life. And as he said uh, to cultural leaders in Paris, which was an interesting venue for him to say that, that uh, there is no such thing as an authentic human culture that isn't based on the search for God and the readiness to listen to him. Now, what does that have to do with life before the council and afterward? In other words, for Joe Sixpack Catholic, how does that universal call to holiness and the challenge that Benedict laid forth actually impact a Catholic life? I, I think it's, it's kind of the totality of it. In other words, that the things we do in the world are not the things that are outside our, our faith, but you know, in, in, in economics, it's not only a matter of seeking profit, but producing something good for people. Uh, the universities, it's a recentering of the, uh, the, the work of the university on the search for truth and not just careerism, uh, politics, not power, but seeking the good. And uh, every human being has to make decisions about these things all the time. And I think it's the integration. If God doesn't make a difference to every aspect of our lives, he's not God. Mm. So would you say then when people say that Vatican II uh, opened the church to the world, is, is that the meaning in which it was supposed to open the church to the world, simply that all of our worldly activities should be informed by our faith? Absolutely, informed. So it's not just a moral proposition. It's really uh, seeing reality as a gift and doing things uh, for, their, for their inner goodness and their truth and not just as instruments for a career or making money or achieving power. And let's talk a little bit about the role of the laity. Again, this is a huge theme in the Second Vatican Council, really celebrating the role of the laity and, and helping lay Catholics realize their, their importance in the church and, and the mission that they uniquely have to do. But again, how did Vatican II uh, redefine that role or, or, or clarify it? What, what were some of the sort of concrete takeaways from Vatican II when it comes to the laity? Well, I think uh, just the sense of participation in the church 
And uh, uh, the, the fundamental achievement, really, of the Council in this regard is the recognition that the laity are themselves part of the inner reality of the church. It isn't simply the church isn't a matter of belonging to the hierarchy and the laity being simply extensions of that, but that's what is related to the recovery of the centrality of Mary and the participation in Mary's role in the church. And so what I would say is that it's not a matter of uh, giving, uh, in the first instance, giving laity new ministries, but a deepening of the reality of God in their lives is the way they participate in the church. Mm. Now, Vatican II has, of course, been a source of both renewal but also great division within the church. We've got one camp that says it was never fully implemented. There's right. this spirit of Vatican II that still hasn't <clears throat> been fully realized. Another group looks at Vatican II and, and often sees so much chaos that came out of it, they're not quite sure what, what the the fruit was from right. it. Uh, we're 50 years out. That seems like a long time to Americans, but I guess in the in the long uh, sweep of history and church history, it's it's not so long. Is that That's right? That's an important point. I mean, these things take time, and it, it's such of such magnitude, the shift and the and the the opening of the missionary, uh, the deepening of the missionary task of the church. But if you look historically with councils in the past, they resolve very deep crises. And it takes a long time for that new teaching that's affirmed at the council to sort of sink in and reorder things. I mean, it's, it's, we're 50 years out, but these things we think in terms of centuries. Mm. I mean, the clarification that Jesus was God and not simply a perfect creature occurs in, you know, three centuries after Christ. I mean, there's, it takes that long for the problem to develop and then to respond to it. And then there was a century clarifying what that meant and the, mag the, the importance of that council. Mm. And I think we have, to, we have to be aware of that and be patient. Mm. Real quickly, uh, I know you know Pope Benedict XVI personally, partly through your work uh, on Communio. And you recently saw him. How's he doing? He is uh, Excellent. I mean, he's obviously he's a man in his 80s. He's fragile. He is alert. He is sharp. And he is his uh, normal, patient, simple, profound self. Mm, good to hear. Dr. David Schindler, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Finally tonight, November is Black Catholic History Month here in the United States. In honor of the occasion, EWTN News Nightly's Wyatt Goolsby recently visited an historic African-American parish in D.C. that's known for its vibrant gospel liturgy. Take a look. I think what makes a gospel mass uh, a gospel mass would be primarily the music, but also the expressiveness of the preaching and the interaction of the congregation. We kind of invite the congregation to sing along with us that sets an environment for everyone to kind of worship together. Music is just a part of the worship diet, if you will. Um, it doesn't overshadow um, the liturgy of the Word. It does not overshadow the liturgy of the Eucharist. It just helps to enhance it. Being in African American parishes for the better part of my 25 years as a priest has utterly changed me. I've become more hopeful, more joyful, and powerfully aware of God's presence in the liturgy. That's all for tonight. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And you can catch our entire program again on EWTN's YouTube page. I'm Colleen Carroll Campbell, and on behalf of all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, thank you for watching, and have a happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you next time.